Thank you all very, very much um, for inviting us here um, to, your, to your church, um, to your community. Um, I was just saying when I walked in, um, my, I have to say to you all, those of you that are members of the congregation, on behalf of my wife and I and many of our neighbors and friends, thank you all so much for every single Christmas holiday season, putting that crush out there. That makes such a positive impact to everyone that comes by there. The Christmas tree is lovely, but that crush, that really gets you in the right spirit. So thank you all very, very much uh, for putting that up every, every year. Um, so we're gonna have a little conversation here um, today, and I hope it is a conversation and we can interact uh, a little bit about the big picture of Moat. Um, most of you are fairly familiar with the history of Moat, so I, I'll try to sort of speed through that part. And then I'll, I'll talk to you, I'll highlight just a couple of the truly grand challenges that um, the continued um, vitality of our oceans are, is facing um, and how moat science uh, and technology development is actually helping to develop solutions and in some cases changing whole paradigms of science to deal with restoring, um, sustainably using and conserving our shared ocean resources. And I will fortunately have Dr. Chapman uh, tag teaming with me so that he can talk about uh, in more depth uh, another one of those grand challenges uh, that our oceans are facing and what he is doing with some very innovative research to deal with that. And then we'll close it all up by really going more into the future of Moat uh, C uh, as well as what is going to happen on our campus here uh, in City Island, on City Island here. So. This is a campus that most all of you and most everyone is familiar, but when, when you talk about Moat and people go, oh yeah, I know, I know Moat, this is usually the campus that most people will um, really be focused on. Um, and it's, it's a place that we've been now for many decades, but I'm a person that always believes it's important to um, have, a, have a good understanding of where you came from because it helps to ground you um, as you're dealing with things today, but also planning for the future. Um, so I'm sure you all, especially those of you that have lived here for some time, know the lady on the left here. That is a picture of Dr. Jeannie Clark, our founding director 68 years ago, 1955. Um, Jeannie um, was an incredible scientist, an incredible person. I had the very good fortune of calling her my friend um, and actually met her when I was a graduate student at the University of Maryland and she was a faculty member there. Um, but Jeannie, when she was younger than this photo and long before she ever came to Moat, um, she was having some incredible exploits all around the world in studying sharks and National Geographic was following her all around the world and documenting all of her work. One of the places where she was very renowned, and there's some books that have been published on the shark lady, uh, was when Jeannie was conducting research uh, in the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba. And she, she was positioned primarily on the Sinai Peninsula, all the way from Ras Muhammad, Sharm el Sheikh, which is down at the Straits of Tehran, which is where the Gulf of Aqaba comes off of uh, the Red Sea. From that point to the top of the Red Sea, where Elat and Aqaba uh, are located. And so she was doing a lot of work there. Um, some of it, she was riding camels, literally riding camels back and forth. And I've got the film and the photos to demonstrate that. Um, and she was doing some amazing work there. Um, and she had just this little one-room shack of a laboratory there uh, in the Sinai from which she conducted her work. And this was all documented in National Geo. And a, a couple, Ann and Bill Vanderbilt, were following Jeannie's exploits. And they sort of fell in love with, with Jeannie and wanted Jeannie to come here to Southwest Florida that they loved. 
and do her work here. So they contacted Jeannie and said, we want you to come here. And the Vanderbilts, you know, a somewhat philanthropic family um, that had a great impact in many different areas of our country over the years, said, we'll build you a little laboratory just like you have in the Sinai, a little one-room shack of a lab. If you come here and we'll support you doing research here. And Jeannie said, sure. I'll, I'll do that. And so this picture on the top right is that little one-room shack of a lab that was built for her down in Cape Hayes. So just down the coastline from us, right before you get to Boca Grande in Placida. That was the beginnings of Moat Marine Laboratory 68 years ago. One woman, one room shack of a lab, and one partner that she had, little known fact, Jeannie the shark lady, didn't know how to catch sharks. And I know this because one of her former Israeli graduate students, when she was working over there, grew up uh, to be another incredible shark scientist. And my good friend and colleague for the work I did in the Gulf of Aqaba a generation later, Avi Baranis. And Avi used to tell me uh, about how Jeannie would lay out lines, uh, basically long lines with hooks on them, to catch sharks so that she could do her research with them. But she, she couldn't tell when there was a shark on the line. And so how did she tell that there was a shark on the line? She told Avi, as a graduate student, to swim out there, snorkel out there, <laughs> dive down on the line and find out if there's a shark there. And that, as I'm sure Dr. Chapman knows from his own experiences, my own experiences, my graduate students when I was faculty, we, we do use graduate students for all kinds of things, um, not the least of which is shark bait. Um, and so Jeannie didn't know how to catch sharks, so she partnered with a local shark fisherman, Burl Chadwick, down there. Uh, and then the Vanderbilts pro provided the philanthropic support. And so I consistently say that Moat was founded on three basic foundational pillars, all that started with Jeannie passion, partnership, and philanthropy. Passion is the passion Jeannie had for her science. She was so passionate about her science, about learning more about the ocean and everything about it. That passion continues to flow through the veins of all of us today in our various aspects of what all of our volunteers share that passion. Everybody in the Moat family shares that passion. And the partnership has grown to be an incredible partnership with this community, especially in Southwest Florida. Moat could not have grown to what it is today without the support of this community, always the support of this community, and all of our volunteers. And then the philanthropic aspects of, we wouldn't have existed without the Vanderbilts and their philanthropic support. And so much of what we do and what we're gonna talk about now would never occur if there wasn't an initial investment of philanthropic support that really enables us to do some pretty incredible science and challenge existing paradigms of science, which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, Moat has grown quite a bit from that little one-room shack of a lab. You know the City Island campus. But we actually have, and this, this slide is, is already out of date, we are now up, we are constructing two new facilities, which will put us at nine actual campuses that Moat has, five in the Keys, including a state-of-the-art International Center for Coral Reef uh, Research and Restoration. Um, the new facility that we're building, Moat C, which we'll talk about in a bit, and also a, a small science education and outreach center we're building out um, on the end of the historic Anna Maria Pier. And that will open, I think we're set to cut the ribbon on May 5th out there. We're set to cut the ribbon on Moat C in December of 2024, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more uh, in a moment. And we've grown not just in terms of the facilities that we have, the infrastructure that we have, but we've grown, so we have two, over 270 staff now. We have well over 40 PhD level researchers, and we are conducting research all around the world, and you'll hear Dr. Chapman talking about uh, the work that he does all around the world. This is just a snippet of the places that we are conducting research all around the world. So we are truly a global research 
powerhouse as large as, if not larger than most major universities, entire colleges of marine science, but most people, when you talk to them about moat, think of that aquarium. And they don't really have an understanding of what this community has helped build. An institution that has 27 very diverse research programs, very diverse, everything from biomedical, immunology, uh, microbiology, to fisheries, marine mammals, sea turtles, ocean technology, uh, sensor development, robotics, artificial intelligence, everything in between. And that's all conducted as part of the Moat Enterprise that you, this community, have actually built. And why are we growing? We're not growing just to say we're getting bigger. We're not growing just to say, well, we're bringing in more money and we're doing, you know, these you know, science programs and we're expanding our science programs. We're doing it because of this. Now, you can't see this. Y'all know who this is, right? I get asked, what does MOAT stand for? What's it an acronym for? And I say it's an acronym for Bill MOAT. Um, MOAT stands for Mr. Bill MOAT, who in the 60s, he went, he's a local boy, born, grew up around Tampa Bay area, fishing, crabbing as a young man, went off to the big city up north, made his fortune, came back down here. He was an avid fisherman, and he wanted to give back. He wanted to give back. And so this quote is, for generations, we've been taking from the sea. Now it's time to give back. And he wanted to give back. And so he wanted to create a fisheries lab. But he knew about Genie, and the K at that time it was called Cape Hayes Marine Lab. And he didn't want to compete with Genie, and he respected Genie, so he met with her. And he explained what he wanted to do. And Genie said, your timing is perfect, perfect because I've just accepted a professorship at the University of Maryland, and I'm leaving. So why don't you just take over this lab? And Mr. Moat did. He took over the lab and moved it up to Siesta Key. And then from Siesta Key, moved it to City Island. And we've grown, and we've grown, and we've grown. And we've grown because it is time for science to give back. As scientists, we are trained. Our culture has always been in academia to basically learn the science, be trained, conduct cutting edge science, and become another faculty member at a university. That's what we do for the most part in our fields. At Moat, we use science and technology to actually give back and deal with some of these great challenges that our oceans are facing. We can't do that without you, and it really is living on Mr. Moat's quote here. I keep wanting to go over and physically change this. So I'm going to talk to you real quick about three grand challenges that the oceans are facing, that moat science, very innovative science, challenging existing paradigms of science, really helped to provide solutions for rest restoring and sustainably using these resources. And each and every one of these that I'm going to talk about, we couldn't get government funding for any of these when we first proposed them because they were outrageous. They were challenging an existing paradigm that said you can't do that. And we said, no, we think we can. And it was every one of them, it was a philanthropic investment that provided that fuel for the innovation, allowed us to do the initial work, then demonstrate to the government, we've done the work, we can do this. Now will you fund us? It's a little catch-22 in government funding. I was at National Science Board a long time. You almost have to already have done the work to then put in the proposal so that they'll actually fund you to do the work that you already did to show them that you can do. It's, it's really a bizarre world sometimes. Um, but this is one of the great challenges. This is a coral head. And this is a quote from a colleague of mine from Australia. This is a place that Dr. Chapman is not from, Australia. Don't ever accuse him of being from Australia. And that, you'll get the fists up. And, um, but um, this is a colleague of mine. The Great Barrier Reef had really been um, almost 
exempt and blessed in not having massive coral bleaching like was being experienced all around the rest of the world for so many years until about 2018. Then they got, unfortunately, a very bad coral bleaching. This is when coral at a higher ocean temperature uh, expel all of their symbiotic zooxanthellae algae. Coral itself is a translucent, clear organism without the algae that gives it its color. You see right through it, and you see the calcium carbonate skeleton. It looks white, therefore coral bleaching, right? Without those algae, if they can't recover from that um, high temperature, within mm, about a week or so, they die. But they can recover, but that's another story. Um, but his point was, we're seeing these 50 to 100-year-old coral dying, and it's, it's incredibly depressing when you see that. And what he was saying was, you can't grow a 100-year-old coral in a decade. You just can't do it. It's not possible. That's the existing paradigm. Throwing up arms and saying, we're losing the coral reefs, and there's nothing we can do about it unless we can cure climate change. You're never going to cure climate change in my lifetime, probably. Unfortunately, that's a fact. And by the way, even if we turn off all the carbon that humans are putting out there right now, you're still going to get increasing ocean temperature for decades. For decades. So bleaching is not going to go away. So what does scientific community do we do? Throw up our arms and say we're just going to monitor coral reefs into extinction? Or do we try to do something about it? At Moat, we tried to do something about it. And we did develop a new technology. Yes, sir? On the previous, the, the ones that look like cantaloupe, mm -hmm. have they been bleached? Is that what? Yes. Okay. Here? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. They should be nice and colorful. This is a new technology that Moat Science developed without government funding. Because when we proposed it, they said, you're nuts. You can't grow a 100-year-old coral in five years. And we said, no, we can do it. And the way we do it is with this new technology that we have developed that microfragments coral into very small pieces, almost a polyp, causes it to grow 40 to 50 times as fast as it normally would. Therefore, oh, now we can grow this coral much faster, right? And that's the truth. But the problem with just being able to do that is when you put that coral out there in the wild and you transplant it out there, what killed the coral in the first place is going to kill it again. So you're going to waste your money and your time. So the real sausage making behind the screen is to complete the entire life cycle. Moat was the first organization for both the branching coral and the massive corals to complete the entire life cycle both in the field and in the laboratory. And as part of this, we actually focus on identifying the resilient genotypes. Everyone in this room, we're all homo sapiens, same species, okay? But each and every one of us, even siblings, daughters, children, parents, we all have a different genotype. And what we're looking for are the genotypes of all the different coral species, hundreds, thousands of different genotypes of every coral species, the genotypes that can withstand, they're resilient to increasing water temperature, increasing ocean acidification. They're resilient to the disease that is killing all of these coral. And those are the coral genotypes of all the different species that we use to outplant. So now we're outplanting coral that grow 40 to 50 times as fast, and they're resilient to what's killing coral all around the world. And we have a 95% success rate with these when we do put them out in the field. But remember, we couldn't get government funding to do this. Now we're getting government funding, not enough. Because our initiative to restore the Florida Coral Reef Track um, to a 25% living coral cover. I, I'm fortunate. I was born in Florida. I lived in Key West as a, as a little fella. Uh, my dad used to go out all the time onto to the reefs. At that time, the living coral cover in the Keys was about 60%, 6-0%. The living coral cover in the Keys now is between 2 and 5%. 
They are not going to come back on their own. It's, they can't. They're too far away from each other. When they spawn, the gametes never meet each other. So they are a dying species. They are slipping into functional extinction right now. This technology makes all the difference. And we have demonstrated $10 million a year, $100 million over 10 years, we can restore the restorable area of the seven iconic reefs in the Florida Keys to a 25% living coral cover. So it, right now, it's not about the technology, it's about the money. So we're working hard to get the money. We're getting government funds, and we're working on corporate sponsorships as well, but philanthropy is still important with this. But this slide, what I wanted to show is, remember I said we outplant branching coral, you can sort of imagine how we do it. We drive a basically a little nail into the uh, old dead substrate. We'd use a zip lock, a cable tie, tie it down there with that, and it grows just fine into this nice bush, branching bush. The boulder coral, like the one I showed in the earlier slide, the way we do this is we go out and we drill little holes all around the top. And the reason I'm doing this is it's sort of like the old hair plug kind of thing that you used to do. And that's exactly what we did here. We took these coral fragments, very, very small. We grow them out in the land-based nursery. They grow up in about six months to be about that size, very, very fast. These things are very, very slow growing. We put them out there in this, and each and every one of these is a fragment from the same mother coral, so identical genotypes, okay? And we know they're resilient because we've already tested them. They grow very, very fast, and they fuse together. Started this one in 2014, this one in 2016. This is the size of a very large dinner plate. That is a coral that usually would take 50 to 75 years to grow. And it happened from 2014 to 2016. So we're doing some incredible things, but we have to close the life cycle completely, which means we have to demonstrate what we put out there is capable not just of growing fast and surviving, but of spawning. We want to put moat out of the business of coral restoration. We want them to become self-replicating again. This is the first time ever published in peer-reviewed literature that we have shown we can do this. It's all documented, peer-reviewed. This is Dr. Hannah Cook, who just sort of spawned herself. She just had a baby, what, two days ago, one day ago? <laughs> yep, yep, little Ruby, little girl, toehead blonde. Um, and she timed her pregnancy. This is, Dr. Cook does coral spawning. Coral spawn once a year, a few days after full moon, first full moon in August. She timed her pregnancy so she could have her little girl and get back in the water in August for the spawning. How she timed that, I don't know, but she did it. But this is, in fact, a coral that was grown over a five-year period, plugs just like you saw on that other slide, over five years, and it spawned, and this is the spawn that came out, that coral survived two coral bleaching events that killed everything around it, Hurricane Irma, Cat 4, that went right over the top of it, and the stony coral tissue loss disease that has a over 90% mortality rate for the coral. That it, it survived all of that and spawned in five years. So we have changed the whole paradigm of coral restoration science. And indeed, I call it the coral Lazarus effect. Most, especially young, younger crowds that I'm talking to, they look at me with this, Lazarus, what, Lazarus? But we can bring back a 100-year-old coral head in as little as five years. That's huge success, huge success, innovation, and your support allowed us to do that. And we partner as well with combat wounded veterans. We don't have enough people at Moat to do all the outplanning, and outplanning is easy. If anybody in here knows how to scuba dive, join us, come on down, we'll train you how to do this. Um, we train volunteers, uh, dive boat operators, everyone. Outplant, just outplant the coral that we tell you are resilient, and you gotta put them exactly where we tell you to put them because it's important to have uh, genetic diversity as well, and everything's, we know where every single one of these coral is planted so that we can track them over time. Second great challenge, again, 
something that really the solution for it, we couldn't get government funding initially and we're hoping we can now, is really predicated on this. In Florida, we, we're fortunate, right? Because we live, the water, the ocean's all around us. So we get fresh seafood all the time. Unfortunately, in the United States as a whole, over 90% of the seafood that we eat is imported. It's all imported. Okay, this is a huge issue. It's a huge issue for our economy because this importation of seafood, depending on the year, is either the second or the third leading contributor to our national trade deficit. That's an issue, okay? And we've overfished our wild population. There's still a growing demand for seafood, so how are we going to deal with this? Okay, well, aquaculture is an important way to deal with this because that takes pressure off the wild population, right? Not necessarily. Depends where the aquaculture is coming from, right? But aquaculture is a growing part of the seafood production and consumption in the world. And in the U.S., of what we bring in, well over 50% of that seafood that we bring in, so about 50% of the seafood we're eating, is imported aquaculture, right? So you're thinking it takes pressure off the wild population. Okay, this slide, I don't know if you all can see it, but these are countries down here, right? Okay, United States, just so you know, is way over here, okay? This is our portion of the global production of aquaculture. Now, if you come down here, this right here is well the overwhelming majority of aquaculture, which means the overwhelming majority of what we are importing, and we are importing over 90% of the seafood we consume, it's coming from aquaculture from China. And I will tell you that we know, because we're very involved globally in aquaculture all around the world, the aquaculture coming from China is not environmentally sustainable. They, in fact, the fish food, and many uh, aquaculture industries in the past did this. China and several other countries are still doing it. They're fishing down the wild population and grinding it up to feed it to the fish in aquaculture. So it's no pressure. In fact, it's even more detrimental to the natural fishery. And the environment, the coastal environments, are being destroyed to produce more and more aquaculture. So we've got an issue where we have uh, an economic problem, a food security problem, and an environmental problem because of the demands for protein from the sea, aquaculture. So what are we going to do about that? That's what we have Moat Aquaculture Research Park for. It was philanthropy that started Moat Aquaculture Research Park to demonstrate that we can produce in an environmentally friendly, sustainable way massive commercial scale operations of aquaculture, marine aquaculture, 13 miles inland in recirculating aquaculture systems, which we have helped pioneer. And that aquaculture is going on right now out at MAP. We, we closed the life cycle on snook for restocking to the wild. We are raising uh, redfish out there for human consumption, uh, triple tail. We're working on um, mullet, um, stone crab, uh, Caribbean king crab. All of these things are, are, are available and many other species if we can transfer that technology out to farmers, to the agriculture industry. When you think about it, Florida should be a leader in the United States in sustainable, environmentally friendly aquaculture systems. The United States should not be importing seafood. We can create a whole new environmentally friendly economy that helps not only the environment, but our economic opportunities, especially for farmers in Florida that are facing citrus greening or losing their family farms, this is a new crop for them. And again, this is science and technology leading the way to develop solutions to a great environmental challenge. And it was launched again, and it's primarily funded even today through philanthropy. I know you don't want to hear about this one. <laughs> this is the third one that I'll talk about that I'm going to Turn it over to Dr. Chapman. Red Tide. Okay. The good Lord is doing 
the only known way right now, the good Lord is hopefully going to finish the job and close this red tide out. If there is such a thing as a normal red tide, they end 75 to 80 percent of the time, they end by April. Okay, we're getting close to April. What it takes to happen, only known way demonstrated so far, cold fronts come through combined with a gentle wind, not an Ian wind, but a gentle wind. Ian actually started this thing. Um, a gentle wind and a bit of rain. All of that is happening. That is why you know we experienced, we are going through a red tide bloom right now. Started about two weeks after Ian because Ian blew all the surface waters offshore. We had all the ripe conditions for a red tide bloom. We've been following it since the summer, 30, 40 miles offshore. Everything was ripe for a bloom and we were keeping our fingers crossed that the loop current, the final piece to bring in that red tide in close to shore and create a real bloom, that was holding off. So we were going, yes, we're going to miss a red tide. Ian came and blew the surface waters off shore. When that happened, the deeper water came up. When the deeper water came up, it had to be replaced by offshore deep water. That brought the Karenia in. And that's what caused, that was the last, actually it was Saharan dust that caused the whole thing. I'll talk to you about that later. And it's for real because of the iron that's attached to the dust that the blue-green algae 30 miles offshore can use to fix nitrogen to start the whole thing. That's how the whole cycle starts. But it's naturally occurring. Some people don't like it when I say that, but it's the God's honest truth. It was happening in the 1700s. The Spanish explorers documented it in their conversations with the indigenous peoples here. They talked about all of the symptoms of a red tide. So it's been documented for at least 300 more years. Science has shown that it has been existing since easily um, the early 1900s here. It is not going to go away. We're never going to eliminate it. Periodically, we have very bad red tides. They are not, we do not, humans do not cause them, okay? We put a lot of nutrients on the land. A lot of those nutrients run off the land. They run into the coastal environment, into our rivers, our embayments. That is not a good thing. It's a bad thing. We need to do a much better job controlling that because it does cause changes in ecosystems, ecosystem disruptions. And it does cause many different types of harmful algal blooms, but not red tide. So you can take all the humans out of Florida. You're still going to have red tide. All the nitrogen we're putting into the nearshore environment absolutely goes into the overall pool of nutrients. So yes, the jury's still out scientifically. Are we exacerbating? Probably we're exacerbating red tides. There's a decent chance under certain circumstances we, our inputs may be causing an extension of the duration, maybe even the intensity level. But I will tell you, the Caloosahatchee River, River, we've got all the data to show this, can have zero output, zero output. And we've had massive, horrible red tides in past decades. We've also had years when the Caloosahatchee is pouring water out from Lake O and not had a red tide. So when you hear people say it's Lake O that's causing a red tide or it's you putting fertilizers on your lawn that is causing a red tide, that is factually not true, okay? But we need to clean it up anyhow for other reasons. Yes, sir? How far have we gotten as far as science working with uh, manufacturers <coughs> to create, you know, the nitrogen and the fertilizers uh, that, that really feed these, these uh, red, red tide moons? Science is always working with corporations. Corporations have their own science departments. No, no corporation that wants to be long-term successful. If any of you, and I'm sure many of you in the room, have been very successful businessmen, businesswomen, you, you don't create a business that is destroying your very environment knowingly. Um, you, try to do, you try to look for win-win situations. In this situation, what we are focused on is using science very directly to decrease the impacts, 
to issue some, at least some governors, some breaks that we can put on red tides when they do occur. We can't stop them completely, but we can decrease the impacts quite a bit. We've been studying red tide for a long, long time. And I'll tell you, Governor DeSantis and the Florida legislature, I don't care what your politics are, we're agnostic at moat when it comes to politics, but they deserve a heck of a lot of credit for buying in to embracing our vision when we said we have the science, we have the technology, we have the knowledge to be able to develop new tools, new mechanisms to decrease the impacts. But you know what? Our legislator, our legislature, and our governor didn't believe us at first. A gentleman walked into my office during the 17, 18, 19 red tide, the horrible one that we had. He was another local guy, born here, his family from here. Went off up north, made a fortune, came back, he came into my office and said, why can't you do something about this red tide? I get that question a lot. You know, we've been giving you money for decades to study this. When are you going to do something about it? And I told him, we can do something about it. We're just not getting the funding for it. All the funding we're getting is restricted for research and for monitoring, not for developing new technologies. If I could only get that, we can do this. And what he said to me was, I'm going to help you with that. He came back about a week later. He handed me a check for a million dollars. That million dollars created the Red Tide Institute at Moat, and in one year, we were able to demonstrate scientifically that we can do this if only we had a long enough period of funding to really do the whole suite. That's when the governor and the legislature, after we proved we can do this, they gave us $18 million over six years to do this new red tide technology development initiative for mitigating the impacts of red tide. And we are in our fourth year now, we're wrapping it up, we got two more years left. And I will tell you, our initial mantra is this, do no greater harm. I can tell you right now how to kill red tide and I could have told you and anybody could tell you 10 years ago. You get a crop duster, you load it full of copper sulfate, you spray that over the top of a red tide that's offshore here, you'll kill that red tide right away. Everyone wins as long as you don't kill everything else in the ocean. And unfortunately, copper sulfate kills everything else in the ocean. So what we're focused on is what can we develop as a tool that doesn't kill the non-target species. And we go through this process where we start literally at the bench top with a beaker. We put Karenia brevis in it. We add the compound that is supposedly the miracle drug. If it kills the Karenia and it denatures the toxin, the brevitoxin, we go, great, we'll take it to the next level. If it doesn't, off-ramp it. The next level are these massive mesocosms in this large uh, facility we built out at Moat Aquaculture Research Park, 13 miles inland, and we test it there, not only with the Karenia, but also with non-target species, right? So we put fish, crab, shrimp, other organisms in there that we don't want to kill. Now if that compound kills the Karenia, denatures the toxin, but doesn't kill the other animals, then we say, Ta-da, we got something. Now let's see if we can actually use it in the field. Do no greater harm. This is just the facility. It's a huge facility. If you haven't seen it, we got to get you out there to see it. Here's the take-home message. After four years, we have looked at over 200 different methods, compounds, uh, technologies. Not just moat, by the way. We, we give money out. We get this money from the state. We manage it. And we are funding people from all around the world to come here to this testing facility to try out their ideas if we think they have a reasonable chance of success. But I tell you, we're funding some pretty crazy ideas, and some of them actually are working. Um, so over 200 compounds that we have looked at, and I'll tell you now, here's all of our partners that we've been working with, private enterprise, other nonprofits, universities. We have identified over a dozen dozen and a half technologies, compounds, methodologies that we know kill Karenia, 
denature the toxin, and do no greater harm to the other organisms. So, for the, so we're, not, we're stopping testing. We've got a dozen and a half. We're stopping. Next two years is all about engineering, scaling this up. How do you deploy these technologies? How do you deploy them in Sarasota Bay versus a canal? a boat canal in a homeowners association in a neighborhood? How do you deploy it along the beach? How do you deploy it 30 miles offshore? Do you deploy it with uh, crop dusters, with airborne drones, with autonomous underwater vehicles that are taught with a sensor to seek out red tide and then deploy? Um, do you do it on barges? Every method is slightly different and we may do it in combination a one-two punch depending on where we are, but the next two years are focusing exclusively on scaling up these technologies for deployment. And at the end of this six-year initiative in two years, we will deliver to the legislature and to the governor, here's everything that we've got, all of the detailed science, now these methods are usable, here's the technology, go for it. And hopefully new businesses are going to start up that are going to be in the business of dealing with this before it ever gets here. And if it does get here, they'll be able to deal with it as well. Another, the fourth great challenge that we're going to talk about today has to do with Dr. Chapman. <laughs> Not that he's a great challenge. <laughs> he's actually wonderful, I tell you. Um, you know, at Moat, I told you, over 270 staff, over 40 PhDs. We're total soft money, is what we call it in our world. No guaranteed funding. We're not a university, so our faculty don't have a guaranteed paycheck. They're not state employees. Nobody at Moat has a contract. You don't have a contract, do you? I shook hands with Dr. Chapman. He had a tenured position. Guaranteed job at a state university. He left that to come to Moat. Ask him why. Ask him why, yeah. But anyhow, Dr. Chapman. All right, thanks very much. All right, so I like to start this talk with a bit of a movie quote. So can, any, can you guys read this? Can you f complete that? We need a bigger boat. So you're all correct, but at Moat we have a little bit of a different philosophy. We need a bigger shark population. So when I say that, a lot of, I see a lot of eyebrows raise up. We don't, you think in Jaws, they didn't want a bigger shark population, right? So you probably think I'm crazy, I'm some sort of stuntman or something like, you know, sharks are dangerous. I'll tell you what, you know what's dangerous? The traffic out here during <laughs> tourist season, that's dangerous. Sharks are not dangerous. Well, not really. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need a bigger shark population and how we are going to get there. Uh, so... This is a picture I took when I was 22 years old in the Bahamas. Uh, it's a great hammerhead shark. Uh, it's about 16 feet long. And you can see it's got a spotted eagle ray sticking out of its mouth. So uh, back then I was kind of uh, fresh off the boat from New Zealand and I was very bold and jumped in the water to take this picture. I learned a lot from this animal or this pair of animals is that sharks eat things that almost nobody else eats. So the reason I show this is because, because they eat these things that nobody else eats, if you take sharks out of the system, you may experience some sort of change because there's nothing out there else that's eating those, those rays. And you can see all kinds of strange knock-on effects when you take predators out of systems. So we know that in the land from taking out big cats and wolves and such, we see these changes. It's probably the same with taking out sharks and rays as well because they're ecologically important too. So sharks and rays are also important tourism resources. So there's lots of people that pay money to go diving with sharks in different places. In fact, it's a billion dollar industry, swimming with sharks, believe it or not. And uh, places like the Bahamas, they make $120 million a year from uh, simply from people going diving with sharks on organized shark dives. This is uh, a whale shark aggregation on the, on the right in Mexico, and that's the, that little tiny thing right there is me. Um, and that's, it's a great picture, but it's very misleading. That shark is not as big as it looks from uh, the little ant-man down there. 
Um, but they make a lot of money from tourism. P tourists want to come and dive with these animals. And sharks are also important for food and livelihood security in parts of the world. So people fish sharks, people eat sharks. Here in the United States, we don't really eat sharks a lot. You can find shark in, in, in Publix, but it's not a real common thing. But they are fished and they are part of the equation, the people that rely on them for their livelihood and their food. So sharks are in the DNA of Moat. Um, the founder, the shark lady, Dr. Jeannie Clark, she did a lot of stuff with sharks. Uh, she did some really groundbreaking stuff because back when she was doing her research, people thought sharks had brains the size of a pea and they uh, weren't smart animals in any way, that they were very primitive. Uh, well, Jeannie had uh, sea pens where she kept sharks alive, and she actually trained them to push a target uh, to uh, ring a bell, and when the bell rung, they got a food reward. And when she did these experiments, they, the sharks learned just as quickly as lab rats how to do that trick. And lab rats, believe it or not, are actually pretty smart animals, and so that really changed the narrative about how smart these animals are. So in Jeannie's time, there was, there was some shark fishing in the United States, but there wasn't a whole lot of it. Um, but uh, in the 1970s and 80s, we saw this big, big global acceleration in fishing for sharks. And the reason is because of this. This is shark fin soup which is a delicacy in Southeast Asia. It's a, a dish that's been served for over 2,000 years. It's the emperor's dish. Um, and in the 1980s, the Chinese economy opened up and they raised millions of people out of poverty, which is fantastic. That's a huge achievement. But of course, with more and more people having wealth over there, they decided to use that wealth to sort of do things that ordinarily they couldn't do and to show they're generous and that they've sort of arrived and made it, and buying shark fin soup was one of those things. So in the 1970s and 80s, all of a sudden there was this massive market for shark fin, for the soup, and uh, people that fish all over the world started really taking notice and going after sharks. In fact, in the United States, the federal government encouraged uh, fishermen and women to go fishing for sharks, uh, but what they didn't do was put a management plan in place. And what we saw was a big giant crash in the shark populations on the coast here and elsewhere in the Atlantic when too many sharks were being caught. And the, 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 really, the, the, the thing that set sharks apart from other fish is that they reproduce more like mammals. So the, the females take a long time to reach maturity and they don't spawn millions of eggs into the water and have larvae. They, hold the, the young in their bodies and they have a pregnancy that can be anywhere up to 24 months. So I've never been pregnant, but I think being pregnant for 24 months would be awful. Um, but aside from feeling pregnant for 24 months, it's kind of awful for sharks because they can only replenish themselves very, very slowly. So if we start taking too many out, all of a sudden the population starts to decline. And that's what we saw throughout the US Atlantic and probably many other places where we weren't monitoring. So in the 1990s, my predecessor, Dr. Bob Huter, was in charge of the Center for Shark Research and he partnered with the federal government and the fishing industry and other scientists to develop the science we needed to figure out how many sharks could be taken sustainably or how many we had to leave in the water so that their populations could recover. And together, that collaboration uh, led to uh, a lot of uh, uh, regulations being put in place. And slowly, we've seen a recovery of, of sharks in the Atlantic as they've replenished themselves. So it's a, it's a real uh, victory for science. And when I started in June of 2021, uh, we, we do a quarterly shark survey out, out here from uh, all the way from Venice to uh, Tampa Bay and we've been doing it for 20 years and we go out we fish for sharks and we sort of measure sharks per hour caught on our, on our gear and in June of 2021 my first survey we caught 103 sharks in four days off the coast here which was a record so that tells us one thing obviously I am the world's greatest shark fisherman because I took over we caught that many sharks no what it tells us in our 20-year survey, we've seen this steady increase in many of these species, which is a reflection of the good science. 
So when I was a university professor, um, uh, uh, I studied a wide variety of topics with, sh with sharks. Um, some of it is very basic science, fundamental science. So I'm a geneticist by training, so I use DNA uh, and look at the DNA of these animals. One of the things we found was that shark, f female sharks can reproduce without sex. So that the ova can sometimes just spontaneously develop into an offspring. So we discovered that, and, and believe it or not, in a, in a tank, in an aquarium in Omaha. Let's talk about a study site I never thought I would be in, is <laughs> in Omaha. And we found it in quite a few species of sharks and rays in captivity. And of course, everybody asked the question, are they doing it in the wild? And sure enough, this thing, the small-toothed sawfish, which is a species of ray that's critically endangered, and it's one of its last strongholds is here in southwest Florida, they, uh, we discovered that they are reproducing on occasion, the females, without sex, just spontaneously producing offspring, which is probably because there's so few of them, sometimes the females don't meet any males. So they sort of cut the males out. So together with the fundamental stuff we do, we do a lot of applied research. So applied research is when you sort of have a problem that you want to solve. It's not studying something for the advancing knowledge just by itself, it's for to actually solve a practical problem. So as I said, um, there's this big shark fin trade, and now we have regulations all over the world protecting certain species of sharks, the most threatened ones, and of course there's all these fins coming into China, uh, mostly through Hong Kong, and of course they have a customs department, and those customs departments, they have to look for the, the fins from protected species, if they're being trafficked, you know, illegally brought in. So we work with the government over there, um, and I, I just uh, returned from there, and we've given them in-port DNA testing. So every, anyone who's done a COVID test before, you know, you, you know what a PCR test is, right? You do this test, and it tells you you got COVID or not, and it's, it, it's done with PCR. Well, this is a, a, a sort of a mobile lab that they can take to the shipping, shipping container port or the airport, and they can get a whole bunch of fins and they can test for is it protected species or not. And if it is, they can seize the whole shipment. And we've actually helped them seize about 80 or 90 tons of shark fins and prosecute many, many smugglers over there. So we're, we're really making an impact on, on the fin trade. So right, right before I started at, at Moat and, and continuing is I led a global survey of, of sharks and rays on coral reefs around the world. And we have very good information here in the United States about how the shark populations are doing because Moat, for example, has been monitoring this spot of the coast for quite some time. In most other parts of the world, they just don't have the resources to go out and, and check how many sharks are in their waters. So we paired up with about 120 other scientists and we were funded by Paul G. Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, to do a project called Global Finprint, where we went to 58 countries and we put GoPro cameras on a frame on the seafloor for one hour. They were baited with one kilo of fish and we looked at uh, more or less sharks per hour, how many sharks came in for a one hour deployment. And so I'm just playing, playing a video right here. This is a lot of what we get. You just you sort of get this video and it's not much happening and you sort of sit there and watch it. We actually had about a thousand people watching videos for us. Um, I'll tell you the total number of videos we had in just a second. But what I want you guys to do is just watch this video. There's a very, very tiny baby shark that comes by. It's very hard to see in the background. And I want to see, um, see, did? No, that was grass. Just keep an eye. It's a tiny little little baby shark from Global Fin Print. Anybody see it? All right, I told a lie. It's not a very tiny baby shark. In fact, it's a very hungry big shark. Comes in, it pushes on the GoPro. So that's a, about a about a ten foot tiger shark. So the, this camera was placed just off the beach in Siesta, Siesta Beach. So if you ever go swimming there, you got to... That's not for real. That's not for real. That's in Jamaica. Don't worry about it. 
So through Global Finprint, again, we went to 58 different countries and we set 15,176 cameras. So that's, one, that's a lot of hours of footage. That, if you play that, st if I, we started now watching all the footage we collected, we would be here for two years. In other words, the average time to get through St. Armand Circle <laughs> during tourist season. Because it's coral reefs, we were focused on coral reef environments, so there's no coral reefs on that, on that coast. That's a, a cold water coast. So 15,176 hours, it's two years. It's also the same as all of the episodes to Days of Our Lives. <laughs> if you, I know which one I would prefer to watch. Um, we, we, in the summer of 2020, we published one of 30 papers that we've, we've produced from this study, but it was sort of the big summary. It was published in the journal Nature. And I'm just showing the results for the Western Atlantic because we are in the Western Atlantic. And, uh, but these are emblematic of what we saw throughout the world. <laughs> but basically what you're looking at is that each one of those triangles is one location where we set around 50 cameras, okay? If the color is dark, it means that 100% or close to or a high proportion of those bravs had a shark on them. So if you, if you see one that's really dark black, it means almost 100% of the bravs had a shark on them. So that would be a positive sign there's a lot of sharks there. If you see white, it means there were zero sharks in 50-ish hours. So what you see, and this is what we saw globally, it's, it's really patchy. In some places, there's lots of sharks. And in other places, there's, there's basically none that we, we, we found in that level of sampling. Not that there's none, but we classify that as what we call functionally extinct. All of these spots, you'd expect to see at least some sharks. To see zero means probably they're so low, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not fulfilling their ecological function. Okay? So um, one of the things we found and we were really interested in, we did this big statistical analysis uh, to figure out what determines how many sharks we saw on a coral reef location. And what we found was that it was almost entirely, the amount of sharks you have on a reef is almost entirely dependent on people in that area, what they are doing. So the places where we saw lots of sharks, the red arrows depict what, we, what I call shark sanctuaries. So these are nations that have just banned shark fishing entirely. So the Bahamas is a good example. And why do they ban shark fishing? We, we, we worked with them in 2011. Uh, it was an easy sell because they make $120 million on live sharks. They don't want their sharks wiped out for fin soup because they make $120 million from live sharks from tourism. So the shark sanctuaries are the red arrows. The yellow arrow is pointing to the Florida Keys. Good amount of sharks in the Florida Keys. And why is that? Because the U.S. put all these regulations in and we, we see this increase. So there's a decent amount of sharks in the Florida Keys. And then there's various other spots, some examples uh, with the green arrows in Brazil, Cuba, um, and uh, Belize, and some other places. We saw individual reefs uh, that were protected, as in there's no fishing of any kind allowed. We saw sharks respond to that. So again, it boils down to what people are doing, how many sharks you have. So uh, in our paper, we concluded that there's four major things you can do as a government to better protect your sharks. You can become a shark sanctuary, obvious. If you stop fishing them, they will probably do well. Um, you can put in catch limits like the United States has. You can prohibit certain kinds of fishing gear, or, or you can make these big protected areas for uh, for these animals. So the cool thing about this is that we have this sort of toolbox now that we know is scientifically valid toolbox of things countries can do to bring their shark populations back. And we have sort of the proof in the pudding that it works, both from the stuff Moat does with the monitoring and also from this big global survey. Okay? So the good thing about having a toolbox is it's not just one thing you can do. So Shark sanctuaries, for example, works very well for the Bahamas when a lot of people make money from shark diving. But a country where some people rely on shark fishing for their livelihood, 
that's not a good solution because they'll lose their livelihoods. In that case, you might want to talk about limiting how much they catch or putting in some protected areas or something of that nature. So having a toolbox is really important so you can engage with local people and come up with a solution that works for them and the sharks. So what we're doing now moving forward is we are putting that into practice. So this is the, the, the shark team at Moat, the shark and the ray team. So, um, and then we have a whole bunch of students. Um, and that, my, as you can see, my students come from all over the world, the Maldives, the Bahamas, uh, India, Colombia. So they, th what we're creating is like shark champions all over the world. So these people will all have their PhD and they will go back to their home country with this toolbox and they will engage with people to actually put in the right measures so that we can have the success that we've had in the United States globally for sharks. And so it's really important that we follow this model that the United States has followed whereby the government communicates with the scientists who communicate with the fishing industry and everybody agrees on what sort of solutions should be put in place. And I wanted to give a very tangible example of how we've put this in place in one country, uh, Belize in Central America. It's a great country if you ever get a chance to visit. It has wonderful coral reefs. Um, and the woman I'm speaking to in that picture, her name is Be Beverly Wade. And at the time, she was the fisheries administrator. And she was really interested um, in our data from Belize. There were some red flags that maybe the shark fishing that was happening was having an impact on these animals. And so Beverly got the fishermen together to come to a meeting with myself and other researchers. And the idea was, was can we do something and, and do something to recover these animals? So one of the things we did together was go out and uh, do shark tagging together. So that's my student Devanshi from India. She's working with Omar and Chippy, who are shark fishermen. Ordinarily, that tiger shark would be toast. Uh, but we hired them to do tagging instead of killing. And it was kind of cool because what we found out is that if you go fishing with somebody you, and you stay on a boat for hours and hours, you build a certain level of trust and you start to speak and have things in common. And ordinarily you'd think a, a conservation biologist and, and, and a bunch of shark fishermen probably wouldn't get along, but we get along great. So these guys told me what they make shark fishing in, 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 in different locations around Belize. And they actually pointed out their most important shark fishing grounds as far as their income. And those were areas that we thought, the government thought, would be good areas to make protected areas. So obviously these guys made me walk the plank because I was saying, well, the government wants to close your fishing areas. But what we did is we actually came up with a solution. What we did was we said, well, okay, if those areas are closed, how much money would you lose? And they told us, and then I was, well, that seems a little high, and negotiated a little bit, and they said, okay, yeah, you're right, Doc, it's a bit less than that. But we came to an agreement, and I said, okay, well, if the government closes those areas, would you support that if Moat hires you to be the monitor, to go out and monitor these areas, tag the sharks, learn about them, and see them if, if they recover? And they said, yeah, that sounds pretty good, Doc, we'll do that. So in, uh, last year, uh, we, uh, the government closed all of these prime fishing areas for sharks and, uh, and the fishermen were on board. They were, they were with it. We've been working with them for several years now tagging. And um, we actually started, practically, they, they gave up these fishing areas about four years ago. Um, the, the, the actual protections has only just started because, you know, government takes longer than just people going out and you know, working together, but we've even seen the shark increase, the sharks increase in these areas um, since we've been working together, and that's just because they're tagging instead of killing. So it's a really um, good way to work together, use the science, create the science together so everybody buys in, and you can put these sort of solutions. So at Moat, we are working in a lot of places in the Western Atlantic to improve the situation. Every one of those yellow triangles is a collaboration between science, governments, and the fishing industry. And each one is a different story like the one I just told you. They're not all exactly the same, but we're working in that model to create as many protected areas, improved sustainable fisheries for sharks 
in lots of areas. And we're not even just staying in that part of the world, we're, we're going into Asia and other places as well. So we have this big global program. I'm very optimistic we can make a big change for sharks. I did want to just briefly touch on some of our research on sharks and rays here in Sarasota. So some of the things we do here, we're very interested in learning uh, some how the sharks interact with other animals in the environment. Um, so one of the ones I just wanted to point out was sharks and dolphins. Something very interesting is that the dolphins of Sarasota have one of the highest incidents of shark bites of any dolphin population in the world. So it's kind of crazy. There's no tourists getting bit by sharks, but the dolphins sure are getting bit by sharks. Um, so we are studying why do the dolphins of Sarasota have more shark bites than, than other, any other uh, or most populations in the world. So stay tuned because we don't know yet. Uh, we're also really interested in the physiology of sharks. How much food do they need? Because as we start to recover these shark populations, eventually they could be sort of like reaching a, a certain level of population where they can no longer sustain it because there's not enough food. So we need to know how many fish do you need on a reef to support a, a shark population of a certain size. So just right down the road at Moat, we have some big research tanks. These are not the ones that you see when you go to the aquarium. They're in, in, sort of in the back. And in one of them, we are building a giant swim tunnel. And when I say giant, it's big. And the, the, the idea is we'll put big sharks into the swim tunnel and we'll get a current going so that they swim and then we'll measure how much oxygen they pull out of the water. And from that, you can calculate their metabolic rate. And from that, you can calculate how much food they need. So people have done this with small fish and sharks, but, uh, and then they extrapolate up to big sharks, but that brings a lot of error with it. So we just said, well, let's just build a really big one and stick really big sharks in there. So it's going to be a heck of a thing to see, um, but that's something that we're building later this year. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention, I, I feel in the United States, we've got a handle on the fishing as a threat to these animals. Of course, we can never like not be vigilant, and we're really curious about the effect that red tide is having on sharks and rays. So um, uh, right, right, right around here in a lot of the canals during the red tide, you see sharks and rays coming way up into the canals and concentrating there. And then you see dead ones piling up because they basically take all the oxygen from the canal. And the reason is the red tide is sort of pushing them around. Now, fortunately, we've done some tracking studies where we see Sharks, big sharks, tend to move away with the red tide, so they, they can get out of there. But don't forget, baby sharks live very close to shore, and they can't go deep. If they go deep, the bigger sharks eat them. So we're concerned that red tide might affect them. We're concerned red tide might affect some of the rays, because the rays tend to stay close to the shore and the base, and they might not be able to escape. So we're really interested in the effect that red tide might be having uh, on these animals, which is just a little bit of the reason why I wanted to come work at Moat, because it's all well and good for me to work with the government to, create, to, to work on the uh, fishing pressure, these animals. That's something that I can tackle, but I do not have the expertise to tackle red tide. So it's really cool to work in an organization where we are bringing coral reefs back. We are mitigating red tide because that'll give my animals the home they need and if I can keep the fishing pressure to the right levels with the government and with the fishing industry, then we, we should have nice, healthy oceans moving forward. So with that, I'm going to hand back. Okay. So do, do you get a, a little feel for why I chased after this guy? And we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Chapman as the director of our uh, National Shark uh, Research Center, uh, which, by the way, is the only na uh, congressionally um, identified, uh, certified shark research center in the United States. And he's the man. So we're very fortunate to have him. But I'm just going to close by talking about where we're going from here. Okay. So our vision, obviously, I think you, you understand, we feel innovative science is so important 
to developing the answers, the solutions to many of the grand challenges that you've heard about today and many, many others as well. So we're going to continue to grow our science enterprise. Um, this site here on City Island, uh, over my career, I've been blessed, a lot of good fortune, work all around the world, led a lot of different things. This is one of the best sites I've ever seen any place in the world for a marine research laboratory. Its location is phenomenal when you think about we have a bay, a coastal lagoon system, barrier islands, the ocean, the river and input. It's just remarkable. It's probably not the location in the world to be attracting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds a million visitors a year to an aquarium. And so I've got these two issues. I need to grow the science, and we need to make our science education more accessible to a much broader cross-section of our community. And so that is why we've decided to move our laboratory out to Nathan Benderson Park and create this new science education center out there so it's much, much more accessible to a much broader cross-section of our community. And when we have done that, and it's under construction now, it will be open December of 24, we are going to transform the City Island campus. We're going to add another 60,000 square feet of research infrastructure. A whole wing is going to be built that is going to focus on derived products from the sea. So we'll put our biomedical, our immunology, our microbiology in there, and we'll add a medicinal chemistry laboratory to that. Another whole wing is going to focus on significantly growing uh, our robotics, uh, our artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, capabilities, the ocean technology, sensor development, all of those kinds of things. A whole wing will be focused on that. So City Island will end up having over 100,000 square feet of incredible research space. And it will evolve into being an international um, marine science technology and innovation park, an incubator. For uh, I intend to hire 10 more. We want over 50 PhD level researchers. But we also want enough space for other scientists from around the world to come for their sabbaticals. We have Fulbrights all the time come to Moat and spend six months or more. But I have many, many more scientists that ask, almost every month I get a request from someone who wants to come here on their sabbatical and spend time with us. Doesn't cost us a penny and I have to turn them down because we don't have the room for them. So we want to make sure we've got the labs that are big enough to invite others from around the world here and have Sarasota and this campus in particular really be a catalyst for potentially out of the intellectual property that comes from all of this, really creating a, a, a kind of a Silicon Valley of marine science and technology um, in terms of an economy here in Southwest Florida, something that's very compatible with our habitat, bless you. But Moat C is equally as important, bless you. Um, it can't be red tide, it's allergies. Um, because this laboratory is located, as I said, in an area that is much, much more accessible. Um, Michael, how many residents is it, uh, four million? Four million residents, not tourists, four million residents can get to this new site within 60 minute drive time. You can't get from Siesta Key, you can't get from downtown Sarasota over here sometimes. Um, so it's much, much more accessible to a much broader cross section. It's an incredible, incredible facility. Many exhibits. This I got to put up here because. This is where I'm going to throw Dr. Chapman about once a week or so when he's in country. In, in all seriousness, this, this huge tank, this is the largest tank, about 400,000 gallons. There'll be over a million gallons of seawater, over 100,000 square feet in this new science education aquarium. Every single one of these exhibits talks about science. But this exhibit is going to focus on elasma brank conservation science, so sharks and rays. We've built it and designed it 
such that we can actually put that small tooth sawfish in there so that Dr. Chapman can go in this tank with all of these animals, put a full face uh, AGA mask on so that he can talk to everybody out there. They can ask questions, they can interact, and we can connect through technology to other countries as well and have our guests interacting with other countries, have our scientists interacting. Just on a conference call yesterday morning with colleagues in Jordan, they are building a science hub and an aquarium modeled after what we are doing. And they want to partner with us on it. So we can do this. And it's great uh, for learning. Other great ex example, huge habitats. The top floor will be Florida waters open to the sky. Um, we'll have our uh, ma much larger manatee tank there. Hugh and Buffett are going out there uh, as well. And we're doing some exciting things that I can talk about at another time in terms of growing our manatee um, recovery, recuperation, and release programs as well. M uh, major new initiatives there, major new initiatives with seagrasses as well, but that's a story for another day. And as I say, every exhibit is about the science. We'll have a whole exhibit on red tide to help people understand it. Every exhibit connects back to science we're doing someplace in the world, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's Southeast Asia, whether it's elsewhere in the Caribbean, in the Middle East, wherever it is we do science, it's going to be relayed in these exhibits. So it's an informal science education center. And it really is something that is what Mr. Moat wanted when he first created Moat Aquarium in 1980. We didn't have an aquarium until 1980. We started in 1955, didn't have an aquarium until 1980 because he wanted people to understand the connections they have with the ocean. That's what our aquarium is, is a science education center. So we want everyone to have an enhanced level of ocean literacy after they visit our aquarium. And I'm just going to go real quick because I want to, sh this is just the first floor, I'm not going to take you through everything, but this is why I put this slide up here. Right here, I'm going to blow it up. These are really where it's so important. Three STEM teaching laboratories. We have structured these for K-12 STEM classes from all of the schools in this entire region to come and to utilize these state-of-the-art facilities that focus on our science. So every day, this lab here, some days, Dr. Chapman will be in here. And you think about an elementary school child with one of our educators, Dr. Chapman interacting in a lesson plan about marine ecology. Think about our biomedical laboratory, having one of our scientists there, one of the educators, children of all ages learning how to do cell culturing. In our ocean technology lab, think of them actually building little robots that then they can put out in the water and track. Think about them beginning to program with machine learning and artificial intelligence. We have developed literally dozens of different lesson plans for every grade level with, in partnership, we've developed these with Sarasota County and Manatee County school systems. So that when the teacher brings that, there'll be a lot of field trips that will come here, but these aren't for field trips. These are for the class to come the second grade class, sixth grade, 11th grade, whatever it might be. And the lesson plans are meant for the schools to be able to check the box off that those children have actually had that experiential learning opportunity that is required at every different grade level. Most schools in our region will never be able to do this because they don't have the money to build this infrastructure. We're building it for them, and we're going to provide it absolutely free of charge to every single school in this region to use. And there are going to be 70,000 students in the structured classes, in addition to all of the field trips. But another thing that we've learned with our outreach in the community and education, an unfortunate fact is, within Sarasota and Manatee County, there are about 24,000 Title I students. Now those Title I students will come as part of their class and experience this. But what we know from our education programs, and I know many of you that may have been educators, 
um, know this as well. It is so important when children, any child, goes home from school to be able to have some positive reinforcement and opportunities for the whole family to be supportive of the learning experiences those children have. Very important to be able to really succeed in the education programs. Unfortunately, many Title I students come from family structures that perhaps aren't a what many might consider a typical, maybe an, an older sibling that is taking care of the entire family. Could be uh, an aged grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, who knows. Um, and many, many Title I families will never be able to afford a ticket price to come to Moat. They just won't, okay? It's expensive for many, many people. And so what we have committed to is every year, in addition, Moat is going to provide every single one of those Title I students. So 24,000 passes will be handed out every year to those Title I students for them to come back to the aquarium without the class so that they can experience the entire informal science education program. But most importantly, that pass allows them to bring their entire family with them absolutely free of charge so that we are helping the whole community really learn more about the connections that they have to the oceans. And, and I'll just close by saying a little quick story. Imagine a little girl, eight years old, goes to an aquarium for the first time. New York, the old original New York, early 1930s. She looks in the tank. She sees the fish. She falls in love with the ocean. She wants to learn more about the ocean. That launched a career of Jeannie Clark because that little girl was Jeannie that went to an aquarium for the very first time, and she told me about this many times, and that's why she loved the Moat Aquarium and how it is a science experience for these children, and she wanted every child to have that opportunity. That's why this is called the Oceans for All campaign. Um, so every child in this region has that opportunity to have that experience and to interact with wonderful scientists like Dr. Chapman. And that's, we've got people, and obviously you can see how passionate he is about his science. He, if you haven't quite caught it yet, he's also very passionate about telling people about what he's doing because it's important work. He's a great communicator. Most all of our scientists are. They're going to love interacting with these children. So we're looking forward to getting him and everybody else and all of you there. Uh, stay tuned. If you haven't been out there yet, Michael Moore, Michael, where are you? Right back there. If you want to have a tour of the site that right now, and it's coming up out of the ground right now, talk to Michael, and he'll take you around uh, and show you around there. The Gulf of Mexico tank, that big one I showed you, those are the two largest acrylic panels. They're due to be delivered, I think it's the end of April, beginning of May, and installed. You might want to go out there for that one, because that's going to be pretty spectacular when you see that. Um, but thank you all very much for your attention. I know it's late, um, and you need to get going. But <laughs> Dr. Chapman will answer any questions you might have. <laughs> Hold on a second. We need to pass this to you so that you can be heard online. So about a month ago, the uh, United Nations made a big deal out of the International Agreement for Monitoring International Oceans um, after 30 years of trying. Um, is that a big deal, or did concessions water it down? What, what does it do for the, the oceans, for... Uh, sustainable fishing for the shark population. Thanks. Well, I, th I think it's a great thing. It, it's taken a long time because it is a very complicated uh, endeavor to get so many countries to agree to anything at all. 
but it's really important that we have some sort of governance of those uh, high seas is what it's called. So it's not completely perfect, but it's a really big step in the right direction. Well, I've been lucky enough to see a, a whale shark uh, 50 some miles out, and that was uh, quite exciting since I didn't know what it was at first. And I was just swimming around the boat and under the boat. We finally had to leave it because it was interfering with our fishing. The second thing I wanted to mention was um, we caught a black tip shark. Uh, about six feet, 125 pounds. It was too heavy for two of us to get in our boat. So I decided to gut it to loosen the, lessen the weight. And I delivered 11 baby sharks. <laughs> All alive. I think they're about ready to be born. They're about uh, probably 12 inches long. And that's why some of my friends call me a midwife. Microphone, please. I speak in foreign tongues, so careful. Uh, <clears throat> where are we in terms of the um, research in your area when it compares to other nations in this world? Are we a China or are we a USA or are we a beginner? That's a very, very good question. Um, when you compare a research institution to another, you know, there's many different metrics one can use. Uh, as I used to be a scientist before I went over to the dark side and became an administrator, so, but I still try to be quantitative about things. Um, and what I will refer you to, I'll, I'll answer your question, but I'll also refer you to for more information on this, um, at universities, when I was a vice chancellor, every five years you go through an accreditation process. Part of the accreditation process is you have to do an evaluation table of all your peer institutions. How do you compare to your peers, which is basically your, your question. And in the science realm, one of the ways we compare is to, um, I'll just take Dr. Chapman, okay, I've got 40-something of these folks, right, PhDs. So how many publications do they have per year? How much grant money do they bring in per year? Um, what is their productivity level in these various metrics? And who are our peers? Because remember, Moat's a completely independent institution, so we're not a peer with, say, uh, Florida State, um, we're not a peer with um, UC San Diego. What we're a peer with are other independent, nonprofit, global research enterprises. There's very, very few of them. Woods Hole is one. Monterey Bay Research Institute is another. And there's about a dozen others that are very, very small. We've done the analysis, and it's actually available for anyone that wants to look at it in terms of patents, technology, publication, grants per PhD. And I will tell you that we rank uh, amongst, the, we are comparable if not better in any given year uh, on a per PhD basis than most any of our peer organizations. And we have that table to show it. In fact, there was a unsolicited, we, I, we didn't even know about it until the publication came out. Um, an independent body did a review of scientific publications of every institution that is AZA certified, which is America's Zoos and Aquarium certified. And Moat came in number two out of like, I don't know, it was nearly 300 institutions, number two. And we came in number two by only, I think in terms of publications, by I think it was one or two. You know who we came in number two to? The Smithsonian. Number three, which I will not name, was way down the list. So in terms of those kinds of independent institutions, it's Moat and the Smithsonian have equal productivity. So I'm very proud 
of the productivity level of, of our scientists at Moat. They're, they're literally some of the best and the brightest any place in the world. And the only reason they're here is because of you. We couldn't be doing what we're doing without your support. So they're your scientists. So you should take uh, appropriate level of satisfaction in what you have brought here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So I've been to the aquaculture facility, and my question is regarding that. If there's future far fish farming, is it the goal to have it anywhere in the, in the world, in any state, and in any environment that they can create it, even if there's no rivers, no oceans, so you could have one in Iowa or Colorado, and it could actually help that economy? Anywhere in the world, like Columbia or anywhere. Very, very good question. Um, our goal is to transfer this technology every place in the world. The closer you get it to where the food is needed, the better. And this is research that is going to help feed the world in an environmentally sustainable way. And it's coming. I mean, population's increasing, protein demand is increasing, the ocean simply can't provide it. Land-based sources of agriculture by itself, especially protein, from the perspective of protein, you're just not going to be able to provide it. And that's why we focused on these massive recirculating kinds of systems. You can do it on small scale. You can do it on large, large commercial scale. So you can have small villages in the middle of Africa doing this. Um, and you can have large commercial scale operations that are growing a environmentally friendly uh, business built on science and technology in the state of Florida, in Florida, in Iowa, wherever. Um, you know, I'm being a Florida boy, I'd, I'd like to see Florida lead the nation in this, but I'm telling you, if we don't, that we are sharing this technology, all of our technology, all of our advances, we share openly um, to have the greatest impact. Um, so if we don't do it in Florida, somebody else is going to do it, but we need to have it done no matter where it's done. 